الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. So it's my absolute honor and privilege to introduce our speaker for the night, Ustad Abdullah Evans. He converted to Islam while in high school, and upon converting, he began to study some of the foundational books of the Islamic tradition under the private tutelage of local scholars while simultaneously pursuing a degree in journalism from Columbia University. Since then, he has studied at Chicagoland's Institute of Islamic Education under the directorship of Mulana Abu Salim in Tarim, Yemen, Azhar, the University of Cairo, Egypt, where he recently graduated with an undergraduate degree in Islamic law. He is also an instructor with Talif Collective and serves as a scholar in residence at Inner City Muslim Action Network in Chicago. Please welcome to Ustad Ubaidullah Evans. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد السلام عليكم SubhanAllah, it's really an honor and a privilege uh, to be spending this Saturday evening with you in Naperville. Uh, this is my first time in a very long time coming to Naperville, and I was pleasantly surprised that you even have paved roads here. Uh, but no, no, I'm just kidding. But of course, it was much longer and much further uh, from the city than I initially realized. But it is important that we spend this time together. In fact, I think I'll use the cordless microphone. It is important that we spend this time together because I don't customarily get time to talk to so many young Muslims on the verge, and I do emphasize on the verge, of entering adulthood. And uh, I remember when I was in your shoes, most of you. I converted to Islam when I was about 15 years old. And I was still in high school. And I still remember all of the pressures of trying to practice my newfound faith and still be accepted by my friends and still be cool as it were. I don't know how good a job I did with being cool, but I tried my best. And the thing that I remembered most was that to be a young Muslim requires tremendous commitment because things are different for you than they are for everybody else. And in my high school years, it was not nearly as hard as it might be for you during your high school and college years. Because right now, you know, and I'm kind of giving away my age now, this was pre-9-11. And Islam, for the most part, was just an unknown quantity. We really didn't know much about it. But now, Islam is in the news media every day. Something negative is being said about Islam. Every day, something negative is being printed about Muslims. And you have to counter this. You have to deal with this. So it's very difficult. But I want you to know something. In the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we learn that when he was taking the Isra, the night journey to Jerusalem, and then the Mi'raj, his ascent through the heavens, one of the hadith about him descending the heavens records that he bumped into. I make it sound so casual. He bumped into Musa. Right? But he came into contact with Moses, with Musa. And in addition to telling him, go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get the number of prayers reduced. Because at first, Allah gave him 50 prayers that Muslims had to perform daily. Thank God that he went back. 
Could you imagine that? He said, go back. But then the Prophet والسلام, would go and go and go. After he got to five, he said to him, I'm shy to go back and ask for a further reduction. And then Moses said to him, would that I would be sent back so that I could be a member of your community. This honor that we have, this distinction that we have been given, being members of a exclusive elite club called the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, never take that for granted. This is something you should always esteem. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Not Donald Trump, not any other political aspirant to some office that thinks it's, it's a good thing to publicly insult and assault Muslims. This is an honor. This is something that even prophets wanted that they did not realize. So hold your head high and know that the flag of Islam is not carried with slippery hands. Grip it firmly. And I'm telling you, and I'm one of the few converts to Islam that can tell you this on the basis of experience. People will respect you. I still remember when I converted, the person that gave me shahada was a Nigerian man, and God bless his heart, but the only two things he gave me upon conversion was, the first thing he gave me was a topi, and the second thing he gave me was like a siwak, a miswak, and nothing else. And these were like the two sacred articles of my Islam, a topi and a stick. And I used to hold both of them very dear to me. I still remember I would encounter people from the majority Muslim world, and I would say to them, you know, I'm Muslim too. And they would say, really? I would just pull out the topi, like. <laughs> or I would pull out the miswak. If I wasn't Muslim, how did I obtain this? <laughs> right? So I still remember the earliest crisis of my young Islam was gathering the confidence to go to school wearing a topi. And so I still remember thinking to myself, one day I'm just gonna go out, I'm just gonna wear this knitted crocheted cap. And I know people are gonna be roasting me when I go to the bus, but it's no problem because I knew how to roast too. If you roasted me, I was gonna get you back. So I remember putting on the cap and walking to the bus stop and everybody looked at me like time had frozen. Well, I knew you were weird when I saw you chewing on a stick, man. But now, you're Jewish? <laughs> and I said, uh, no, actually, brother, I'm Muslim. And my friends, of course, they made fun of me. They talked about, is everything cool? Okay. Alhamdulillah. They, you know, they're, they associated Islam with the nation of Islam. So they talked about bean pies and bow ties and they made jokes. But because I was committed and I persevered, first, my younger sister became Muslim. And she was only 12 years old. It was the easiest shahada I have ever given. I came home, my sister said to me, hey Will, everybody's saying that you're Muslim now. I said, yeah, this is true. Well, I want to be one too. <laughs> Three of my close friends also accepted Islam. And we were there together practicing Islam in high school and shortly thereafter. But you have to be firm. You have to be strong. People don't admire you at first. But in the end, they will respect you if you have integrity. The word integrity in the English language comes from the same root as integer. See, I'm in the room with daisies, you can talk math language. If everybody knows, you guys kill at math. Right, but we call it, a number is an integer when it's whole. You have integrity when you're whole. When your speech and your actions match. People respect this. And when you do so, 
you will gain people's admiration. Don't worry about the temporary. The difficulty we experience with the greater community is increasing our love and devotion to one another as a community. I wouldn't have made it through that time if it weren't for brothers. And if my sister wouldn't have made it through that time if it wasn't for sisters. We have to be together. This is what's important. I remember one of my teachers told me a story. Listen very closely to this story. He said that he was once in uh, inner city Philadelphia. And it was very uncommon to see guys that represented like a punk rock aesthetic. You know, I'm talking, you know, spikes and piercings and colored hair and stuff like that. And he said that they were sitting in inner city Philadelphia and three guys walked in dressed like this, three white guys. In fact, in his neighborhood, he explained to me that it was very uncommon to see white guys, period. And as soon as they came in, everybody became uncomfortable. Imagine, what the heck, man? And everybody started looking at them. But they appeared to be so comfortable with each other. They ordered their food, they sat down, and they just started talking like it was nobody's business. And he said, because they were so comfortable with each other, it helped us to be comfortable with them. This, to me, indicates the importance of suhbah. If we're comfortable with each other, other people will be comfortable with us. But you can't even find comfort in the company of Muslims. How, can, how do you expect to find company? How do you expect to find comfort in the company of other people? The second thing is we have to start encouraging each other, validating each other. There is a beautiful story about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. Sayyidina Umar, you have to understand, a lot of the reports, if you read a book like Tamiz al-Sahaba, in which the Sahaba are described, we read that Sayyidina Umar was maybe 6'8 or 6'9. He was extremely brawny. People said that when Umar descended upon a gathering, you thought that he was mounted on a horse. They also say that Kana Asla, don't get, uh, don't get scared of me, but Asla, he was bald headed. And let me tell you, that's intimidating to people. I'm just kidding. My man over there knows I'm just kidding. You, you with me, man? Okay. I'm good. Right. Kana Asla. And then they say, his sharib, his mustache, Kana Yufatilu, he used to twist his mustache. Right? So you're talking about somebody very intimidating, perhaps even frightening. So once, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting with the Sahabiyat, he was sitting with the female members of his companions. And he was studying with them. And this is why, mashallah, I'm pleased that so many sisters came tonight. Because the Prophet Sallallahu never had qualms about granting women access to him. So he's with them, he's answering their questions, he's teaching and instructing them. And all of a sudden, Sayyidina Umar descends on that gathering. And the women just start running in every direction. Just start running away almost instantly. And he calls out to them, Ya a'da'i anfusikunna. Oh, you enemies unto yourselves. Do you flee from me? But you can stand with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You all really don't know what power is. These are muscles, but he has the real power. And the women respond, Ya Umar, but the Prophet is agreeable and approachable. You, on the other hand, we find you quite frightening. And Sayyidina Umar looked at the Prophet والسلام, and the Prophet said, Ya Umar, it's true. You are like that. Now this is not something to be taken lightly. These people loved the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And nothing would produce heartbreak like hearing that you are inherently different than him. This, when we read the hadith, we read it like, oh yeah, Umar, it's true. Ha 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 ha. 
No, Alma, you are different than me in some significant ways. And just to say, no, Alma was about to become what's called in English crestfallen. He was about to be sad, dejected, hurt because he was different than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet called out to him, Ya Amr, don't worry about it because you don't go one way except that the shaitan goes the other way. And this hadith was more than the Prophet alayhi wasallam simply making a statement about Omar. He was validating his friend. He was saying, and I'll translate for you, Omar, you may be different than me, but don't worry about it. You're cool just the way you are. And sometimes we need our friends to tell us that. To tell us, you know what, man, you're okay. You're okay, you're fine by me. I think you're doing a great job. Muslim women, especially our young women who this is something new for them, they go out wearing the hijab, they get stares. They get bad looks. They get cold glances. And sometimes we don't stop to say, you know what, that's really courageous what you do. And I respect it. Me, I go to the airport, I'm not Ubaidullah, I'm Will Evans. You don't have a choice but to be conspicuously identified as Muslim. But I appreciate that. You're holding it down for me. We have to tell each other this, we have to affirm each other. There's a story about the Prophet ﷺ in which he's standing in his masjid on Eid. And he's watching some of the newly converted Ethiopians of Banu Arfidah, right? This Ethiopian tribe. And they were in the masjid, a very lazy translation will read, they were dancing in the masjid. And I'm thinking, why black folks always got to be dancing? But what they were doing were choreographed military exercises, you know, kind of like drilling. But there clearly was a rhythmic component to it. And in one riwayah, they were saying, Muhammadun nafsun tayyibah. Muhammad is a pure soul. And Sayyidina Omar, again, this offended his sensibility. And he started to throw rocks at them. Some people say it was because this was the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Other people say it's because he was unaccustomed to this kind of rhythmic movement. In any case, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Omar, leave them alone. And in one narration, Banu Arfidah, carry on. Show us what you have. Because I want people to know there is levity in this great religion. There's a place for everybody. Maybe you tell jokes, that's okay. Maybe you just come around every once in a while, that's okay. One of the biggest deficits in our community, there's a deficit of real friendship. It's sad to me that Muslims don't understand it. And I'm not talking about that Facebook stuff. I'm talking about people that you really care about, people that you're really concerned about, people that you're willing to sacrifice for. One of the things that made a tremendous impression upon me when I was thinking about converting to Islam, and you won't believe this when I tell you, the simple ayah, فَإِذَا تَعِمْتُمْ فَانْتَشِرُوا After you've taken your food, leave. This, was, this blew me away. Because when I read the tafsir, the interpretation of this verse, this was about the Prophet ﷺ getting married, inviting some of his companions back to his place for a walima. And they enjoyed his company so much that they overstayed their welcome. And you know how when someone is overstaying their welcome, you start dropping like subtle hints. Maybe they're there, you start cutting out the lights in other rooms. Maybe at first you had on, you know, uh, clothes, you come back in your PJs. Yeah, go ahead, keep talking. But they're not picking up any of these indications. And the Prophet wasallam valued their friendship and their companionship so much. And he was so shy, he refused to tell them that he wanted some privacy. Now think about that.
He receives revelation from God and he's shy to tell them, I would like some privacy because he valued their friendship and their companionship that much. That's a friend. This is somebody that's a friend. I'm willing to suffer inconvenience to make my friends comfortable. The next day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down wahi. After you have eaten your food, get out. Leave. When you hang around, it annoys the Prophet ﷺ. He's shy to tell you, but Allah is not shy to tell you the truth. This is, the Prophet knew how to be a friend. We have to relearn how to be friends. And one of the ways you do that is not always talking about deen. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يخير يخير بين الأيام في الوعظ. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to choose different days that he would talk about the deen. He would choose different days to do wa'af because he knew how to just hang out with people. You look at the Shema'il of Imam Tirmidhi and you have two descriptions of the Prophet One description says he was al basam He was Dahak. The one that was always smiling. The one that was always laughing. And then another description of the Prophet says he was stern, he was grave, he was serious. The scholars look at this and they say when he was alone, he was serious. He was stern, he was grave. He was reflecting on the meeting with Allah. He was thinking about how to alleviate oppression. But when he was in the company of other people, he was laughing, he was smiling, he was gentle, he was approachable, he was easygoing. The reason we don't have friendship is because we reverse those two. We come among our friends, stuck for a while, I'm Muslim, I don't joke, I don't smile, and I don't laugh. But when we're alone, we're watching basketball games and surfing the internet and having a good time. It's supposed to be the other way around. When you're in the company of your friends, don't be a killjoy. Don't be the kind of person we're all sitting around just having a good time, talking about something leisurely, and then someone says, you know, I was reading this tafsir last night. Oh. Just learn how to be a friend. And muslimun we support each other, we hold each other up. The third thing that I want to mention to you, and this is perhaps the most significant, because most of you are young Muslims, you will inevitably make certain mistakes. And one of my teachers told me to promise Never to talk to a young audience of Muslims except that you talk about Tawbah. You have to talk about repentance. Because all of us make mistakes. The Prophet said, Kulu bani Adam wa khayrun tawabun. All of the children of Adam make mistakes. And the best of those that make mistakes are those that repent from the mistakes that they make. One of the things that really hurts my heart when I talk to younger Muslim audiences is that we have not realized that our Lord Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Al-Ghafoor Al-Wadud, He's merciful, He's beneficent, He's forgiving, and He's loving. I was once in, a, in, the, in the company of young Muslims and someone asked them to lower their heads and he said, everybody who believes that Allah is angry with him or her, raise your hand. And like 85% of the people in the audience raised their hands. And I said, subhanallah, hal na'arifu rabbana. Do we know our Lord? Do we know of his mercy? Do we know of his forgiveness? Do we know that he accepts repentance by day and by night? And we don't need any intermediary. To repent to Allah. You're young, you're going to make mistakes, but come back from your mistakes. The Prophet said, kunta. Fear Allah wherever you are. Wa atbi al hasanata tamshuha. 
and follow any bad thing that you do with something good. And the good deed will remove the bad deed. Just because you fall, you don't have to wallow. Just because you fall, get back up. You made a mistake, get back up. Make Toba. But Toba in Islam does have conditions. But these are very simple, easy to realize conditions. The first of them is nedim, remorse. You have to have some remorse about the sins that you commit. The Prophet ﷺ said, "In lab if al mashit, or if al mashit." If you don't feel any shame about disobeying Allah, do whatever you want. Don't take that the wrong way. Some people will, I don't feel any shame, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. No, but the fact that you don't feel shame about your disobedience is worse than the act itself. So you should have some kind of nedim, but you should not have so much remorse that you're prevented from repenting to Allah. People that feel like Allah will never forgive me. Don't despair of God's mercy. In fact, some of our ulama say that if you do something and you believe that your sin is greater than God's capacity to forgive, you could be in danger of committing shirk because His forgiveness is always greater than your sin. And don't underestimate him in that way. But you should feel some remorse. So if you find somebody bragging about the sins they commit, bragging about how they beat somebody up, or posting on Facebook about how they got it in at the club the other night, chances are the repentance is not sincere. You should feel some kind of nedim, which is like remorse, regret, shame. The second condition of Tawbah is Tawakkuf. You have to cease and desist. You have to stop committing the sin before you can repent to God from the sin. If a person is looking at a website that they know they shouldn't be looking at, and they're saying, stuck for the law, a stuck for the law, but they're still clicking, a stuck for the law, a stuck. Then the intonation changes. A'udhu billah. Astaghfirullah. It's not Toba until you stop and close that website. If a person is cracking the seal on an alcoholic beverage and they're saying, Rabbi ighfirli. Oh my Lord, forgive me. But they're still cracking that seal. It's not Toba until they stop. One of the most beautiful things you read about the commitment and devotion of the companions is that when the verses of the prohibition of alcohol were revealed, some of them were mid-sip and they threw down the alcohol. You have to stop. The third condition of Toba is that you have to promise never to go back to that sin. So you cannot make Toba, you cannot repent to God temporarily. It doesn't work like that. I call this the beginning of Ramadan Toba. You see, you can't, you know, call that significant other that you know you shouldn't have and say, look, you know, Ramadan is about to start. We should stop. We can't do this. You know, let's just like put things like on pause for Ramadan. And then the first day of Shawwal, you, you know, it's the hotline bling told me. You used to call me on my cell phone. You can't do that. You can't make Toba to Allah and say, you know, I'm, going, I'm not, you know, stuck for the law. I'm, I'm going to leave it alone. But when my birthday comes, all bets are off. I can't make any promises. I don't know what's going to happen. No, no. You have to promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this sin that I'm repenting from, I'm never going back to it. I'm finished with it. I'm done with it. Now, the beautiful thing about Islam, and this, this is very beautiful in my estimation, is that we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has what we call an aqidah, simple eternal knowledge. He knows everything. 
He knows everything that was, everything that's going to be. So if you are engaged in a habitual sin, something that's difficult for you to give up, and you make tawbah to Allah, and He knows that in two weeks you're going back to the sin, or two months you're going back to the sin, or two hours you're going back to the sin, if you're sincere in the moment that you repent to Him, He forgives you for your sincerity in that moment. In that moment, even if He knows you won't be able to give this up. And there's a hadith from the Prophet Wasallam. We should all have this tapped on our refrigerators. And there's some weakness in its chain, but its meaning is certainly reinforced by what we find in the Quran. That if a person commits a sin, repents from the sin, commits a sin, repents from the sin, and dies in that state, he or she will be raised with the mujahideen on Yom al Because they never gave in. They never said, this is what I do. I drink. This is what I do. I go out. This is what I do. I like to party. Every time they did it, they were able to acknowledge their wrongdoing and put themselves back on the path of guidance. And this is how we should be. Al-Mujahidu man jahad nafsahu fi ta'atillah. The Mujahid is struggling against himself. Struggling against herself in the obedience of Allah. And sometimes it's not easy. But just because you're personally weak, you should never be discouraged from making tawbah. You make tawbah, you make a mistake, make tawbah again. Again and again and again. And you will find your Lord forgiving again and again and again. And the last condition of tawbah is that if you have wronged anybody else, you have to mend the fences. You have to repair that damage. See, it isn't enough that you steal from everybody and then say, Astaghfirullah, but you don't repay anybody. No, you have to pay people back, which is bad news for politicians, but they still should become Muslim, inshallah. <laughs> You have to pay people back. You can't take from people, say, okay, atubu ilallah. I, make, I repent to Allah, and then it's over. No, you have to repay what you've taken. If you have slandered someone, if you've talked behind someone's back, you have to ask their forgiveness. And here, the scholars say, you should exercise some discretion. Because if you go to anybody, and you say, you know, the other day, we were talking about absolute creeps in the Muslim community and your name came up, you know. They might not ever forgive you. But if you go to someone and you say, if I have ever done anything to offend you, will you please grant me your forgiveness? Every one of us that desires God's mercy will certainly grant you that forgiveness. Have mercy on those on earth and the one above the heavens will have mercy on you. But these are the conditions of Tawbah. And those are the things that, you know, my time was a little condensed. I'm coming in from Columbus, Ohio. I started this morning, I had a halakha here in Chicago, then to Columbus and back. My flight was delayed, so I wanted to give a much more elaborate talk. But if I can leave you with anything, be confident in your Muslim identity. Don't let anybody call your patriotism or your belongingness in this country into question. You have just as much right to be here as anybody else. And this, I don't even know what to call this guy with the orange hair that hasn't offered one real substantive idea since he took to the campaign trail. Donald Trump, the poster boy of corporate greed, Rebirthed as the face of American populism. I, this, it's amazing to me. But don't let him or any other joker make you feel somehow insecure about your being here as Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought this community here for a wisdom, for a wise purpose. 
and let no one tell you otherwise. This is an exclusive members only club called the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, one that even prophets wanted to be a part of and we have that honor, we have that distinction and we should esteem it. The second thing, we have to support each other. We have to inculcate very deep understandings of friendship among each other. Just being supportive of one another. Learning how just to be with one another and reinforcing our efforts collectively. And third, if you make mistakes of any sort, don't stay down. Get back up. Your Lord is Ghafoor and Rahim. Just those three things. Very simple, somewhat disjointed, but I might still have a little jet lag. Forgive me. But if we can realize them, make them points of practice in our community, inshallah ta'ala, we will be better for it. After Isha, we will come back for question and answer, inshallah. And I look forward to having a, a fruitful conversation with you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.